Welcome back. Um, it's, it's good to see you here. Um, Maria is producing a copy of the handout. It's the same that we used before. Um, I thought I'd start with a bit of recapitulation of what we did last time. I think it's, it's important that we make this um, connect to what we've done last time. Um, I said something about what I think a workshop is. Um, we agreed that most languages are probably fine in this room. Um, I don't know how we're actually going to manage to hear you on this because we'll have to use the microphone. Um, and this is what I, what I started. We had a fair bit more discussion last time than I had anticipated, so I gave a really long handout, but that's okay. We're going to recycle it um, today, and that's actually going to be um, very useful. And my, my starting point... Whoa, this is really cool. Um, my, my, my starting point last time um, what you thought Roman poetry was, um, if you remember, I, I thought it would be a fun idea to ask you what is Roman poetry and we had a, what I thought really useful discussion starting from the observation, well maybe it's like any other poetry. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. I was very young at the time. I don't remember what Roman poetry was like. But what I thought I could do today is ask you a slightly different question, just so that we get the discussion going again, um, and then we'll, we'll move on a bit. There are lots of different kinds of museums out there. I'm sure you've all been to a museum, maybe even recently. Um, I've been to a museum, um, in, in fact, Earlier today, I've, um, my, my uh, girlfriend um, was here to visit and I wanted her to see the, the beautiful house um, of the Countess of Lebricha, um, which is a wonderful place. If you have never been, go. It's, it's fantastic. Also, I think she must have been crazy, but <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it's a fantastic place. But it's, it's, it's not a museum proper. Maybe you're more familiar with different kinds of museums, such as the archaeological museum. Um, but the, the museum that I'm particularly interested in is the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, a beautiful building, I'm sure you all know that Museum of the Fine Arts in, in uh, Sevilla. And I was, I was wondering, and he, here's, here's my first question, essentially. Um, do, do you think that if we went to the Museum of Fine Arts in Sevilla and, and looked at the art on display, that this is an accurate representation of drawing and painting of Sevilla or the province of Andalusia or in fact of all painting and drawing in the world. So does that museum give you an accurate idea of what painting and drawing in the world is like? And just to confuse you a bit more before you start discussing, maybe you enjoy drawing and painting. Maybe you enjoy it but never show it to anyone. But maybe you do enjoy painting and drawing. How does the museum relate to what you do, what your friends do, what you did in school, um, to what you see in newspapers and so on? So just the question once more, how accurate do you think the Museum of Fine Arts in Sevilla captures the way in which people paint and draw. Maybe you want to discuss this. Is this museum an accurate representation or is it something else entirely? I'll give you some minutes to think this through and to discuss with a friend um, and, and then we'll get some, some ideas, okay? What about an exhibition of street art? What about an exhibition of, of street art? It's not part of their regular exhibition, is it? It, it would be some, some temporary exhibition. Yeah. Um, one would really like to see it um, at, at some point. 
question is, should it be in this museum? Does that qualify for Bayas artists, or is, is it something else? Um, but it, it would be really interesting. Can I hear some other ideas? Feel free to speak in Spanish as, as before, of course. Um, it's your country, you should speak your language. It's, I apologize for not doing it. Um, any thoughts? I heard you mumble, so there were some thoughts other than how can I get out of this room. Um, Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's accurate because it only shows us selected uh, drawings or sculptures at the time. Um, the time, I mean, a period of time, but of course, every year, every every second, people are drawing, are making art, and they are not represented in this museum. Mm -hmm. Okay, is is that something we can agree on? <coughs> It, it, it seems uncontroversial. I, I, I agree as well. I'm just asking if people disagree because I like disagreement. But I can't disagree. I think you're right. Um, other thoughts? And, and Concha just gave an example of what might be missing. You know, could we change it by putting on something like street art? Um, maybe there are further ideas. Maybe they're not. That's okay. The reason why I'm asking this is, is very much related to the two responses that we got initially. I find, it's all right, um, I, I find museums fantastic. I love going to museums, but they are curated. Museums have professionals taking care of their collections. They have people giving money. They have people giving objects. And they have professionals curating an exhibition. They decide what to put on display and what to hide from you. Most museums, unlike the house of the Countess of um, Lebrija, um, where absolutely everything is on display. Although, have you been to the second floor? There's a second floor, I found out today. Um, you can't actually go up there. Um, there's yet another, no, there's a second floor, there's ground floor, first floor, and second floor. Try and go to second floor, it's not going to happen. But, um, so, so un un unless you go to this peculiar museum, people make a choice. They say, you should be able to see this, because it's a great painter. It could be Murillo, if you enjoy that kind of painting on, and drawing, for example. But they don't show you everything. They don't show you the drawings necessarily. For that, you have to go to the archive of the Indias at the moment. Um, it's a fantastic collection um, of, of his drawings. They're, they're very keen to make everything drawn by and, and, and painted by Murillo, um, not so much other artists. You know, you, you have a certain selection of names that come up again and again. Um, if it's not by that person, it seems to be less valuable, right? Have you heard about this incident in, in London recently um, where a painting of Banksy has been, has been with, with, a sca um, with, with a shredder? It's, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, what a great idea. Um, but the name Banksy seems to be worth something because the painting, the, the the, the image essentially is stupid, right? I mean, we can probably agree it's a stupid painting. Everyone can do this. The difference is not everyone does it, but everyone could do it. It's not very difficult. You need a spray can and the ability to draw something really simple. But because people assume it is by a specific artist, it becomes very expensive. And then people put it in collections and show you the, what they think the best pieces are. And that makes it even more expensive. When you hear about a museum heist, people will steal what's on display. They don't go into the archives and steal the stuff that's not even visible. They will go for the expensive stuff. And it becomes expensive because it is on display. Why, what does this have to do 
with what we are talking about, do you think? Why am I telling you this on a beautiful Wednesday afternoon? Why am I talking about this, do you think? Because we are stuck in poetry of unknown thoughts. I'm the, the poetry that I like to talk about is the one that never gets into the museum of poetry. If we were to think of a museum in which we put poetry on display, our authors wouldn't be in there. Could there be further reasons? Think it through. What happens in a museum? People are collecting. People are deciding how valuable it is. People are putting on display. People are putting it into a context. One of the beautiful things of the, houses, of, of the house that I went to today, of the, the Countess of Lebricha, is that she put things next to each other that you will not ever see in any other museum next to each other. Etruscan, Muslim art, Roman art, things that she found in her backyard. It's, it's beautifully insane and insanely beautiful. But she made connections that other people often don't. When you go to the archaeological museum here, you will be taken through a chronological route, which seems to make sense. Except it doesn't always make sense because you only have one way of going through it, unless you intrude and the guard will throw you out. But you have to follow the route that is prescribed. It's a linear way through that collection. Although you might decide to look at one thing first and at the other thing second, but you have to follow the sequence of rooms. There is no shortcut. You, you were quite right in saying that one of the reasons why I introduced this example is because I think um, we should talk about what is on display. But there's more that I think is really important. What I think is really important is that we need to think about at least two more aspects, maybe three. The first aspect is, who is the curator? And I'm afraid when it comes to Latin poetry, it's us. Some of us get paid more, others of you are still interns hoping to become those curators or museum professionals who go to schools and advertise it, maybe. But you will be those people. You will be the curators of that exhibition. And that's a huge responsibility because you will decide what you put on display. We can also talk about ethics and the display. What should be on display? And I think this is a question that we as classicists, as Latin scholars or as classical philologists or however you would like to describe your own role, don't often think about. Most, if not all of you, will have had some Latin at school, I presume, right? What did you read at school? How many inscriptions have you read at school? Can I see a show of hands of people who have read an inscription at school? That's a shame, we work so hard, right? <laughs> who of you have read Virgil at school? Virgilio? Ovidio? Cicerón? How did you like Cicero? But not yet, not yet at school. No, no, I'll, I'll start at school because that's where most people get to know our subject. Um, Livy, Livius. Yeah. Do you like Cicero? I mean, just out of curiosity, does it inspire you? Do, do, do you like reading five pages and on the final page you finally have a verb? So, no? And the verb is, is not. <laughs> I didn't think so. And the, the important question to me is, why do you have to read this? 
is that really different from somebody making a decision, like in a museum, saying, you should be looking at this painting? And even though there are lots of other paintings by the same painter, you have to look at this one. You have to look at the Mona Lisa. Okay, it is a female. Her face seems to be smiling to an extent, but I mean, there are lots and lots and lots of paintings of females who are smiling somewhat in the painting. In fact, most poster reproductions are better than the actual painting of, of that particular one. I can reassure you, it's a bit dangerous to go to Paris right now. Um, Although, the, the, the most interesting question to me today is, will I still have a prime minister after two hours? Um, British politics is really interesting right now. This is a responsibility. And I think we don't always, if ever, think this through. How do we decide at university? How do schools, how do politicians decide what you should be reading. And most of the time, we just accept this. Because maybe they think if you only ever spend four or five years doing Latin, at the very least, you should have read Virgil, or Ovid, or Cicero. Now, I remember when I first read Cicero, I was halfway through my puberty, and it wasn't great. I actually quite hated him. Um, I just didn't like him. He did not speak to me. Um, Horace, another author that I really hated at school. And still somebody thought I should be looking at this. I'll tell you a slightly different story, but it's related. When when I was about 16, I decided um, to go on a school trip. Okay? The school trip took me to the Limes in Germany. The Limes is the, the Roman frontier. Okay? Um, it's essentially, the, um, when, you, when you think about Roman Germany, um, the, the, the main Roman frontiers are the Rhine and the Danube. But the Romans decided to, to shorten that line, so they pushed a bit into that territory beyond the Rhine and the Danube and built a wall. That's a great story, always building a wall. Um, part of it made of wood, the other um, part made of stone. As they did in many parts of the, of the world, you have it in Africa, you have it in, in Asia. Um, the Romans liked building walls. You have it in Britain, of course. You have it in Game of Thrones. It's, it's always a wall. And our teacher thought it would be a good idea to walk all the way. That's a long walk, and it was great fun. But he thought those young people at school would be inspired if I asked them to draw something. Could you draw a Roman fortification, a castellum? Could you draw a Roman watchtower? So I did. I'm not good at drawing. My works will never be in the museum, I can promise you. Um, it's safe to go. But I did some, I, I, at the time and to, to the present day, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Rolling Stones. Um, sorry if you're more of a Beatles fan, I, I respect you, but I'm not. Um, so I drew my castellum and I drew a little poster onto the wall and sort of said that the Lapides Volventis would be coming to town. Um, that's just. You know, I need help, that's what I'm saying. And my teacher gave me a very low mark for disrespecting the, 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 the sincerity of the Romans by doing something as stupid as that. And I thought that's, that's really strange because all the time when we were walking, we found everyday objects in the museums. You know, there were plates and... Um, glasses and graffiti and all this, so they clearly did this, but in my teacher's head, they didn't. Now, this may be a problem of this one teacher, but I guess, again, the question would be, at school, how much do we actually learn about anyone else but Cicero and Livy and Caesar and Sallust 
I mean, it sounds like a long list of names, but it's not. We're probably talking about a name of a, a list of about 20 names, right? If, if I ask you to write down all the Latin classics that you can immediately think of, would the list exceed maybe 20 names, maybe 24? This is a very short list. If we think of a territory of this size and of over a thousand years of history, that's a very short list. It's probably about as short as the list of great names that we find in the Fine Art Museum. So I think the question that we need to consider, and this is what I'm, I'm going to, to uh, that's what I would like to do with you and invite you to do today with me, is who makes those decisions and are they good decisions and can we interfere with those decisions? So this just for setting the scene, okay, so that you get an idea of what my thinking behind this is. Just to, to, to explain one thing straight away, I'm not saying don't read Virgil. I'm not saying don't read Horace. They're great authors. But as custodians, as, as the people who curate that museum and who will have the responsibility to curate it for the next generation, are we doing something that's ethically responsible if we pretend that all that Roman poetry is about is about those 20, 24 names that exist out there. Is this responsible? And the second question is, is it useful? But I'll, I'll come back to this. Last time I overran, because you, you guys were great at, at discussing and, and, and telling me things, and I was nearly killed by the person who wanted to get into the room next. I wasn't, I'm making this up. Um, he was lovely and said nothing had happened. But I had barely finished my, my review of the inscriptions from, from Seville. So what I would like to do today is have a look at those inscriptions that we didn't talk about. And there are two very interesting geographical contexts, interesting to me, um, that I have chosen. Contexts that today, if I had to build a museum of poetry, would be very visible. Britain and Germany, both countries with a fantastic poetic tradition. If you had to ask, if, if you ask me, could you come up with a museum of English poetry, I would have so many names to choose from and none of them would be Roman. If I had to build a museum of German poetry, lots and lots of names to choose from, none of them would be Roman. But I'd like to look at their Roman poetry today, okay? So on the handout, do we, is, is there a handout somewhere near you so that you can have a look? Okay, um, I've chosen a few examples. Let me get to the relevant slide. So, Looking at, at Roman Britain, to give you an idea, I, I put a web link there where I put um, something online that has, virt that, no, that has all the certainly ancient Latin inscriptions from, Latin verse inscriptions from, from Roman Britain on it. We're talking about about two dozen inscriptions. So a part of the Roman Empire that has been a part of the Roman Empire for 400 years and that reaches from essentially Roman London and, and um, you know, the, the Strait of Dover to, to Hadrian's Wall, including everything that's south of Hadrian's Wall. Over those 400 years, some 24 Latin inscriptions have survived. That has to be the saddest province I know. Okay, there's nothing happening. I'm sure um, that we can find places in, in Spain that have more than 24 inscriptions in, in verse, or at least close. Um, how's it looking for, for Triad? Um, how many inscriptions do you have for Triad? Um, ish? Yeah? So all of Roman Britain, 24, over 400 years. It's not great. Okay, but I thought, um, what I would do is uh, give you some, some examples. And the question that I would like to, like to consider is, 
from those examples, what do you think life in Roman Britain was like? Okay, I'll talk you through those five examples that I've chosen, five or six examples, and we'll ask you to, to have a think about what did these people think? What was their concern? Because to me, poetry is a way of giving shape to feelings. I think that's what poetry fundamentally does. It's a way of expressing one's feelings, and that could be, I'm so funny, to I have a real problem, okay? So let me talk you through the examples. The first one um, is, and I, I briefly mentioned this before I ran out of time, is a mosaic from Kent. Kent is part of the Roman, um, of, of Roman Britain that is very civilized indeed. Very civilized indeed. Cold, but we may not have a government, but very civilized. This is from a filthy rich villa, a really expensive Roman villa in Kent, south of London. Um, you see that um, scene there, it's, it's a Europa, um, Europa scene, um, and it comes with those, um, well, with a distich, okay, with, an, uh, with a distich in which the speaker is assumed to say, you know, had Juno seen how bad the bull is at swimming, she would have gone to Islas much quicker, much more, much sooner. It's funny. It's objectively funny. It's also a great feminist um, stance, you know, and although she probably should have just have got a gun and got rid of that bull. Um, this is a dining room decoration. You sit around this. It's very sizable. It's enough to have your dining beds arranged around it. Um, so this is, this is my first example of what you can find in Britain. This is, I think we can probably agree, sophisticated. Okay. The second example that I would like to, like to show you um, is a little cube. It's, it's, it's about this size. It's not very big, it's just a couple of shoe boxes. Um, this is um, found about an hour away from Oxford, somewhere between Oxford and um, Gloucester, so, so north, um, northwest of Oxford. Um, dates to the mid uh, fourth century, uh, comes with a hexametrical inscription in which somebody who's a provincial administrator says that he has restored a religious object. The religious object is a column, um, and it's a column dedicated to um, Jupiter. Um, those columns are very common in northern provinces. I don't know, um, if you have any of those columns in the Belgica, but they're certainly common in Germany. Jupiter giant columns, they are called. Um, and some of them must have existed in, in Britain as well. It's a northern way of celebrating Jupiter. I don't know why they had the columns. It's, I'm sure there's something going on in people's head when they see a column, I, I don't know. Anyway, this person says um, he restored this object um, connecting to, to, to previous faith, to the um, Antiqua Religio. And that gives you a firm indication of the date, because we are in the time of Julian the Apostate, in which Christian, so the, the spread of Christian religion is essentially pushed back a bit, and people are celebrating the old gods again. That seems to be the context of this object, okay? The third one, um, and we briefly talked about this last time, but I'll, I'll introduce it again. The, the picture is very bad, but I can send out the, the, the slides. Um, this, is, um, this, this is a beautiful piece from um, Roman Britain's north. It gets really cold up there. Um, if you think it's cold here now, that's their summer, okay? Um, except more rain. And 
So in, in, in this part of the country, um, this remarkable inscription has been set up and we talked about this very briefly because it has a lot of allusions to star signs, to astrology, to um, astronomical observations. And the, the, the beautiful thing of this text, it doesn't make any sense in Latin, it doesn't make any sense in whatever translation you're looking at. It's a really difficult text. But what this person who seems to have been running a military unit is doing is essentially that he's saying we're all worshipping, we, we, we all live under the same sky and we're worshipping the same deity. And to me this is a beautiful piece because a Roman military commander of a small military unit is dealing with ethnic diversity. This is something that you will not necessarily find in Spain. This is a remarkable piece because as a Roman province, when the Romans came there, they did not come as Italians, okay? They, they brought their auxiliary military forces coming from all parts of the Roman Empire, from Syria, I hope these people brought warm clothes, um, from North Africa, from the Black Sea, everywhere um, the Romans recruited their military personnel and went to Roman Britain. The reason is obvious. A, some people wanted to become Roman citizens, and B, you stop fraternizing. If you bring foreigners, they will not mix with the locals. So you, you, you kind of try to reduce fraternizing. At the same time, this brings problems. When you bring in lots of foreigners, and even the, those foreigners may have disagreements, how do you tell them we are on the same mission? How do you tell them that they are fighting for the same thing? How do you unite them? Spain may soon see an increase of immigration um, because other countries have decided to close their harbors. In Germany, we, we see it. We took in over a million people from Syria and other countries, and we have foreigners who have been in Germany since the Second World War. We have migrants from Turkey and Italy and Greece and former Yugoslavia already there, and now Arabs are coming. How do you explain to these people that they are all fighting, all working for the same reason? It's a really difficult thing, and I think what's happened in this inscription is that somebody says we're all fighting the same cause and we're all believing the same thing. There's at least one God out there that we can all believe in. You may call them different names, but ultimately that Virgo is something we all worship under different names. I think that would be my explanation for the piece. Moving on, um, this, uh, this, this next item, um, is, uh, is, is also from Rome's north. Um, and this is about a soldier who had a dream. Or is it? So someone had a dream and a soldier called Fabius erected this altar. to the venerable nymphs. The Romans did this. It's, it's a common thing um, in, in Latin epigraphy. You come across this as ex visu. Somebody had a dream and in the dream some god, some goddess told them do something. And so they did in a little metrical inscription. I don't know what the dream said. He doesn't tell us. I don't know who Fabius is. Nobody knows. Staying up north, this is one of my favorite inscriptions from Roman Britain. This is from somebody who says, um, essentially, my business isn't going well. Um, I hope my business will improve. And if it does, I will 
create a new inscription, a new poem, and fill the letters with gold, every single letter with gold. Now, the golden inscription has not been found. So there are two possible explanations. Either praying didn't work, or the gold was stolen. I don't know. There's no trace of gold in this one, so we must be talking about a different inscription um, anyway. But I think the text is very obvious in that regard. A beautiful piece because it talks about the text on a, on a meta level as well. It talks about a material text that you can adorn by pouring some additional gold over it. And I think that's the final one I've chosen, is this one. This is in York, um, now God's own country, Yorkshire. Um, great if you enjoy tea and accents that nobody can understand. It's beautiful. I'm kidding them with affection go there. It's, it's, it is really beautiful. Um, this is a funerary inscription um, set up by somebody for, for the, a little daughter who died aged 12, I think. Is it 12? I think it is. 13, Corellia Optata. Interesting name, Optata, somebody who has been hoped for. You might immediately start thinking about a Northern African tradition there. That's a typical Northern African name. But, I mean, we don't know. So here are those, um, those, those texts, taken some of them from Rome's north. That's one of the areas in which we find a fair few inscriptions. Some of them from the middle of the country, like this one. York isn't that um, high north. You still have several hours on the train to get from York to Hadrian's Wall, so it's still at least two hours. Um, and that's when you're lucky and the trains is, are actually working. Um, which on that line is not a given, and some, but some from the very south. So I would like you to discuss this among yourselves now. Looking at this selection, what do you think these people hoped? What do you think these people feared? What do you think life in Roman Britain was like if this is your evidence? Okay, I'll, I'll give you some minutes and then, then we'll compare how, you, how, how these texts make you feel or respond, okay? And I give my arm a rest. Cause... What, what do you see here? The, the, the text that you're looking at, okay? Bear in mind there are 24 poems, 24-ish poems from, from Roman Britain. So you're actually seeing a significant proportion of this. What you don't see is a single text in which an actual Briton has written something. We're looking at texts probably all produced by foreigners, by people who arrived in Roman Britain. But let's 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 start with with my first with my first curiosity. Um, I I said to me poetry is, is is a way in which people express their emotions and in, in which they express their their feelings. Looking at those texts, what what kind of hopes, what kind of positive feelings do you think these people had? It's a small selection. It's not representative of anything, but. Is, is there anything that stands out to you? Any immediate response to this? They wanted the gods to be... They wanted the gods to be supportive, to be helpful. Um, if I asked you to, to give me an example of this, you could give me several examples. You could give me the one about the dream, you know, that the God shouldn't be mean. Um, you could talk about that, that one and say, you know, maybe they prayed for the daughter and then lost her. It's interesting that there's no mother in this text, by the way. Um, we could talk about that merchant who was hoping for improvement of his life 
um, saying there's going to be a present for you if you help me. So having a good relationship with the gods seems to be something that is very visible. Are there other responses? Thanks. I, th I think that's, that's a really important observation, and maybe that's what, what other people discussed as well. But are there other observations? I would say that somehow there is some kind of feeling of security of living because they are living in a foreign country, in a place uncivilized, in the limits of the mm -hmm. known world, civilization. Yeah. And maybe, uh, as this lady said, they uh, trust the gods, but maybe that is a reflection of the insecurity they feel. They need to, to trust in revelations, mm -hmm. through dreams, maybe through mm -hmm. uh, offering things to the gods. They, they need, I think, the ability to mm -hmm. expect some help from, from dreams, from the gods, from some manifestation yeah. of some kind of power protecting them or giving some security in a, in a foreign situation, no? in a difficult situation. Thanks. That's that. That's great. Um, is is that a feeling that that, that is shared? Do do you get a similar similar sense from those texts? Um, that there's some agreement. I I agree. It's it's much harder to 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 find the concrete evidence, but there is this sensation that life is in constant danger somehow, isn't it? Um, economically, physically. Um, that, that, that even religion itself could be something that's threatened if we think of the, the inscription from Siren Sester, the, the cube, um, where somebody says, let's restore the old religion. Something is constantly threatened. Now, if you think back when we talked about um, the other inscriptions, those inscriptions from Seville, there's a very different feeling there, right? If, if we think about those Kamina from Seville, from, from uh, Hispalis, um, what you will find is that there are a couple of early examples in which people have lost someone at a young age, but all of a sudden the city in its poetry seems to have converted into a city of religious splendor. People are celebrating themselves. In Roman Britain, why I don't have a cluster of inscriptions as close as, as this, but the overall feeling, it, regardless of where I look on the map, seems to be one of feeling threatened, feeling angst, feel, feeling anxious, feeling terrified, hoping that the gods will do something. Are there other feelings? I, I think that's, that's really great. But are there other sensations, other emotions that you get out of these out of these texts, not necessarily making you feel, but the, the, the emotions that you feel expressed by those who wrote that poetry. That's great, really good, thanks. There, there, there are other questions we could ask, and in, in, in a way they are related to this, but the, the, the question that I have a lot of the time looking at Roman Britain is, what are these people doing there? If you come from a place like, say, Syria, or in fact Spain, and you go to Hadrian's Wall, where it's eternally dark even in summer, and where you know there are people living on the other side of that wall whose main, dis whose main problem in life is, how can I kill you? That must be a strange life. It's not a life that was experienced by those people living in Seville 1,800 years ago. It's a very different part of the Roman Empire. And even though, even though the inscriptions are few and far in between, very few, from very different parts of the country, we only see one here in which there's no threat whatsoever. In, that's, that's the one with Europa and the joke, right? That's, that's where Roman life has become stable. But over those, and, and I've, I've given you a range of, of dates for those inscriptions, over those 400 years of Roman occupation, there's virtually nothing that gives you the sense that these people are just happy celebrating their lives. We're getting soldiers who don't mention the mother of a child, who lose their child and feel hopeless. 
we see merchants struggling. What are you going to sell there? I don't know. Again, what business did that person even have? But it, it, it very much feels as though winter has arrived in, in uh, Roman Britain, which is true all the time. It's, we have, the, um, Maria, you, you went to Hadrian's Wall uh, recently. How did it make you feel as a southerner? Did you bring warm clothes? Yeah, the whole time I, I was asking myself the same question. I went in July and the weather was just like this. And I said, not horrible, but not summer of the weather. Mm. And I was so, the and whole time thinking, what were these people doing here? Because and you, you can confirm it was a glorious summer in in, in yeah. Britain. <laughs> it it was by our standards. I mean, the it, it it was above twenty centigrades. It it was brilliant. There was hardly any rain. But it was cold and it was very windy mm. in July. How did you like the landscape? It was beautiful. It is beautiful, but beautiful how? Have, have any of you been to Hadrian's Wall other than people I know? How would you describe the landscape? Feel free to describe it in Spanish. I mean, the flowers were green, the flowers were like very poetic from our point of view, obviously. If you have to live there, I assume it's not easy because it's not very well communicated. Um, don't know. Now, Hadrian's Wall today is about this high, yeah. okay? Um, which even I could jump across, even I could do it. Um, maybe a second attempt, but I could, I can train, I, I, I should probably train and I can do it. Having it much higher, and you were there at the warmest time of year, it's not getting any warmer. There's lots of water, which does not help because Cold and damp is awful. You experience this in your flats at the moment because they're not very well insulated. Um, cold and wet is terrible. Roman Britain, cold and wet is even more terrible. Feeling threatened for one's life is awful. And the reason why we like the landscape is because we enjoy, we, 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 we enjoy folk music. Um, we, we enjoy a romantic approach to life. It's, there's nothing, there's positively nothing. It's a heath, so you have um, low shrubs, occasional trees. It looks a bit like the label on a whiskey bottle, okay? That's, that's what it looks like. Which is pretty, but would you like to live there? If your choice is living here or living there? Maybe not. Would you like to live there? with lots of people from other parts of the Roman Empire, of, you know, you can fly for several hours, that have nothing in common with you, with the sole purpose of probably getting killed. Maybe not. I mean, most of us don't want to get killed, I, I, I get it. Um, so, in, in other contexts, we often talk about things like Romanization. I think that term has become a bit unfashionable now, but people have used it um, a lot, and acculturation. So the Roman soldiers, in a way, are cultural ambassadors, right? But of what? If, if I put together some of you, some colleagues from Catalonia, some from Italy, and some from Morocco, and ask you to represent the Roman Empire, how much would you have in common? little. Maybe you can start to bond over things you enjoy, like having a PlayStation, or, um, listening to some, <coughs> some music. But in, in, in many ways you're much closer than those people because they never met elsewhere. You know, I mean, when in the Roman Empire, living in, say, Italy, would you meet somebody from North Africa? Why would you meet them? So all of a sudden you are put under this stress in a place that the, the only thing you can agree on is that you all hate it and would like to leave. It's a really interesting, we, 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 as, uh, especially as philologists, I mean ancient historians ask this question a lot more, but to us as philologists it's, it's a question that we don't naturally ask. <coughs> what is this like? But to me, this is important because at the beginning I said, you know, imagine a museum. 
where in my museum of great poetry is Roman Britain? Probably in the loo, I don't know. <laughs> it's, um, but these people did write poetry. These people did write poetry. I gave you five or six examples of this. And when you go through this poetry, you will find that they read Virgil and that they read Ovid, or at least knew how to quote it, how at least to remember half a line of something. In Reading, where I live, um, I, um, I, I showed you when you came to the, to the workshop, there's a little tile with half a line of Virgil on it, Conticuere Omnes, everyone fell silent, a bit like my class. Um, <laughs> But um, this is Roman culture too. But Roman culture is difficult. And when I said we, we, we have a responsibility, I think one of the responsibilities we have as curators of our profession is we have to be honest. I think we have to be fundamentally honest. and. The majority of Roman poetry is not Virgil, and it's not of it, but what you're looking at. This is the norm. Of it and Virgil stand out. And this is the norm. One of the things that comes partly out of your responses, but that we haven't really explored yet, is in which context do these people write? It's death. It's negotiating with the gods because they have been told to or because they want something. It's representation. I could give you some graffiti um, just next to the um, half an hour's drive from Vindolanda, the one place that everyone knows of Roman Britain because of the writing tablets. Um, somebody wrote a line of Virgil into, into a rock. I mean, that's as close to the enemy as you can get. And, so you write something about um, Victoria is, is fl not you <laughs> um, is is, uh, is 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 flying with her w fluttering with her wings. You know, it's, what is going on in these people's head? This is the default of Roman art. This is the average of Roman art. And we often say we need to talk about the outstanding, about the excellent Roman poets. Well, they really stand out from the material that's the norm. And I think this is something that needs to inform the way in which we act as people who are responsible for our material and who will be responsible because um, if you're not in the profession yet with a job and hope to become a school teacher or a university lecturer or a professor of whatever sort, you will be in charge of this. It will be your decision what will be on the curriculum if you're lucky enough to teach at university. You can probably to an extent decide what you would like to teach and you've made a decision. Um, maybe you have to talk to colleagues and say, I would like to teach this and not something else. But you can probably decide, I'm reading my inscriptions or I'm reading Celius Italicus, whom nobody ever read, of course. But how do you decide? How do you decide? How should one go about this? I'd like to talk about um, a second province, um, and that's, that's Roman Germany. This is a difficult concept because there's no such thing really as Roman Germany. Um, there are a lot of provinces um, that are partly in the territory that's Germany today. Okay? There are two provinces that have Germania in its title, Germania Inferior, Germania Superior, no quality judgment. Um, but there's also Raetia, Raetia um, that's in, in sort of essentially below the Danube, but it goes much further, it goes into the Alps. Um, but also part of the territory that, that you're dealing with, um, Victoria, um, as, as you know, in, in the Gallia Belgica is technically part of Roman Germany, if you see Germany as a political term nowadays, even though in Roman administrative terms it belongs somewhere else. 
so I again chose the same number of examples for us to look at, and what I, I will talk you through them, and I would like to ask you, how's this different from Roman Britain, for example, because we just looked at Britain. So, this, I think, is the oldest example of poetry in, in Germany. It's um, a really bad hexameter line, a really bad hexameter line. It doesn't um, work, but I think it's, it's probably hexametrical. Um, this is a centurion um, with his two freedmen who got killed during the Varian disaster. Does that mean anything to you? The, the battle in the Teutoburg um, forest when Arminius, Hermann the German, um, decide to defect and kill them all, and Augustus was weeping and saying, give me my legions back, rete mihi legiones. Yeah. Well, he was one of those thousands of people who got killed in the Cladis Variana. And this inscription comes from Xanten, that's fairly high up on the, on the um, Rhine River, so moving towards the Netherlands. Um, it's, it's an inscription created for um, a tomb in which there was now a physical body, a cenotaph, um, but saying if he gets found, he may be buried here. If you want to, if, if, if Game of Thrones isn't creepy and awful enough for you, read Tacitus. Read Tacitus' description of the expedition of the Roman soldiers to the battlefield to recover the dead bodies. It is one of the most horrendous stories ever written in Latin. Absolutely awful. Um, visiting a battlefield after the battle. It's breathtaking to the present day, very moving. So here we have one soldier who got missing, that was deemed deceased, missing in action, um, and who got a tombstone so that the brother had a place to go and remember him. Okay. The second one I'd like to talk about briefly is, um, is this one. This is most remarkable for a number of um, reasons. This is from uh, Regensburg. It has nothing to do with rain, even though Regensburg sounds like rain. Um, this is in, um, well, technically Bavaria. Um, but it's actually related to the Latin name Regina. That's the name of a river there. It's nothing to do. It's not even Regina, it's Regina. Um, the name of a river. And this remarkable piece um, has been explained in many different ways. Some people have thought these are very late Saturnians. They're not. Um, they're actually iambic Dimitris and Aristophanians. This would be something for Rotheo. Yes, it is exactly the kind of stuff that um, Paolo Coguzzi should have included in um, in, in his article on the um, Poetae Novelli, um, so that's um, fairly fairly late. It's metrically super sophisticated. And what's what's happening here is this: um, we have a soldier, Marcus Aemilius, who was actually the tr um, um, a military tribune, tribunus militum. He says where he comes from in a very awkward, long-winded way. And he dedicates this stone to the La and the La Runda of the Vindeliki for providing a sanctuary. And he does this after he returns to the towered fortress Turigeras at Arches. So what's happened here, um, I, I could ask you to find out because the text is really weird, but I'll, I'll spare you the, the headache. What's happened here is, is this, this military tribune was on a mission, probably behind, beyond enemy lines. So this person led a group of soldiers into enemy territory 
and he returned to Rigeras at Arcis, which is a poetic way of saying Castra Regina. And because he was so grateful that he survived, he set up this stone to the La, which is essentially a deity of where home is, and La Runda, which is the female counterpart, sometimes described as the mother of the Lares, but it doesn't matter so much. So somebody who had successfully completed a very dangerous mission into enemy territory returned and expressed his gratitude. It's a unique piece in many ways, also for its metrical um, design, absolutely stunning. The third piece is fairly late, obviously Christian. Um, as you can see, there are some well, it looks like peacocks, but I, I think um, any, any bird explanation will do, but you also have the Christogram on there. Um, this, this is a heartbreaking little piece for um, a, young, a young boy, um, Desideratus, who lived six months. The next one comes from, um, from a very famous sanctuary. And this is, for many reasons, one of the, the inscriptions from Roman Germany that I like best. Um, not by absolute means, but I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, it has two inscriptions on them, um, or it has a bilingual inscription on them, one in Greek, one in Latin. They almost say the same thing, but not quite. But what has happened is that um, a man called Tychicus suffered pains. And if you ever ask yourself, maybe you didn't, um, maybe you did ask and you didn't come find the answer, but if you ever ask yourself, did the Romans know much about mental health? This is an example where he says, I had physical pains and mental health problems. It had an impact on his soul. This is a wonderful piece. And just as an aside, when I talk about the Museum of Roman Verbal Art, about Roman poetry, is it unreasonable to have a room to talk about people who had mental health problems? I mean, we talk about this a lot today um, in, in all contexts, but have classical philologists ever anything to say on this? Because I think Virgil and Ovid don't have the answer. In the verse inscriptions, we see how people dealt with this. We see how people described their suffering, described their failure, described their pains, and dealt with problems that we all may have or may encounter in our lives. This is very close to what people can relate to because people are in pain, and people suffer from depression. It's a thing. Here we have somebody who suffered from pain and mental health problems. He doesn't talk in our medical language, so we don't know what his mental health problem was, but we know that he had one, because he talks about it. And then he went to a sanctuary of one Leno Mars, which is a local um, deity, very famous in that, that, that sanctuary. And something worked for him. Something mysteriously worked for him. To me, this is a beautiful piece because it talks about a real life problem. A real life problem that Virgil and Ovid will never address. Moving on, the next Item. So here we have a funerary um, stela. Um, this is, if you like, a bit of murder. I don't think we've talked about murders too much yet. Um, but this is, um, this is a shepherd who got killed um, by, the, by a freedman. And there's a bit of poetic justice, if you like, poetic justice. This is your inscription. Um, because the, the, the murderer tried to escape, jumped into the river, mine, Monos, and drowned. We may find it funny, we may find it sad. 
The beautiful thing about this to me is that we automatically assume the nameless murderer actually maybe didn't have a reason, right? I mean, what if this person was actually really awful and you know, we, we, we see one perspective, but it works. It's a beautiful poem because it has poetic justice in it. We, 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 we love this one. What else have we have? Um, oh, I don't have, um, I don't have an example um, for this for this um, final one, but it's, it's inscribed on, on, a, on a jug, on a um, jara in, in Spanish, a, a drinking vessel. Yeah. Um, and um, it's, it's, um, it, it says, um, stop talking, stop drinking, which is always good advice. So here are six, five, six examples from Roman Germany. And again, they are fairly representative of the material. I, I'm, I'm not trying to mislead you. Germany has some, if, if we talk about the modern state, Germany has about 60 or so, 60, 65 verse inscriptions. Um, there are some obvious centers. Um, Trier is one of them. Um, but Cologne, um, Xanten, Mainz, Mogontiacum, um, they are the centers of inscriptions. So, like Spain, you have centers of where these happen. Um, most of them are related to legionary um, fortifications. Um, Mainz and Cologne very obviously are Roman foundations. That's where the legions were stationed in Germany. Um, and that's where a lot of administrative um, things um, obviously happened. And, and Trier is an altogether different situation. Xanten is exactly the same. But there are some sporadic examples otherwise, and the material is fairly representative of what you find in Germany. So look at these texts and ask yourself similar questions as before when we looked at the British inscriptions. What are these people about? It's my impression too. Can we try and explain a bit more what makes them different in, in, in your view? They speak about life. And the others are more, were more artificial. There's something immensely artificial about the, Britain, uh, about the British inscriptions. These seem to, to speak um, about life, even though death is obviously is, is a theme. But um, let's, let's, let's As take this. they were um, happier. It's, it's not quite as dark and, and, and fearsome as Britain, I agree. Now, the good thing about Germany is that there are areas in which you can actually grow wine. In Britain, yes, they, they try, but it's not great. Um, you may actually enjoy white wines from Germany. Um, you don't really grow very good red wines, I think. Um, but white wines from Germany you can grow. And that's exactly following the rivers and uh, the, the limes. That's exactly the, as far as the Romans went, that's where you can grow wine. So naturally, life's better <laughs> um, and sunnier. Um, other immediate responses, or maybe you would like to discuss a bit more. The name Tychicus immediately seems to point to the to the Greek half of the the empire. So we have a fair few arrivals. Um, that's also true, in fact, for the inscription for the guy from from Regensburg, um, who very very heavy-handedly describes where he's from from Ateste. Um, and so, like Britain, that's actually where it's similar. We have a lot of new arrivals. But something is different. Something is different. There, there seems to be a sense of life, of um, a more positive, established, established life. That's, that's exactly right. Um, and even though there's a constant fear of attacks and a very real attack, um, lots of real attacks happen across the rivers, um, it, it does not feel like you're 
almost always about to leave again. These people have established themselves. And in fact, in, in some cases in, in Germany, if you, um, if, if you go to, to places like, in fact, um, Trier and the, the whole um, Mosul um, region, Mosul being the defining river of, of that part of um, Germany, Mosella, Ausronius wrote a great poem about it. Um, it could have happened that people would have spoken a Romance language in there. There's evidence for a Romance language distinctive to that area emerging, Mosul Romanisch. Um, which is almost reads like Italian, actually, to, to an extent. So it, it could well have happened had not then a uh, movement of peoples um, changed the linguistic landscape. But those people have arrived and they don't intend to leave. Whereas in Britain, it feels like occupation yeah. and, and fear. Other, other responses, I think. That's, that's, that's a really good observation, yeah. Other. I think, if, if I can add to this while you, while you keep um, thinking, another aspect in, in which we can see that there's a sense of arrival is all of a sudden we're talking about um, people who actually um, own land and, and cultivate it. So we have the, the shepherd, the pecuarius in, um, in, in one of these cases, um, and these people too are beginning to produce poetry. We can, I could have given you different examples of, of people talking about well-trained slaves, um, such as the, the one that Manfred was talking about at, at our conference, where somebody is trained as um, a musician and somebody writing shorthand. So we see poetry emerging in different contexts. This is more, an a, a overall more elevated, more consolidated sense, sense of life, that I shouldn't be talking all the time. Any other? Would you like a short break, uh, five minutes or so? Otherwise, I'll just keep keep going. Um, I will definitely stop before seven. Um, to finish at seven. Oh, we will stop before that. Okay. Today, I was supposed to talk about the importance of teaching materials, and I will. I have four important questions. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask this. I, I started with that first one. As classical philologists, um, you may not enjoy talking about politics because it's a way in which people disagree very quickly and it's never nice to talk about politics unless you're talking to someone who thinks the exact same thing, uh, thing as you, otherwise it just gets violent very easily. But what I would like to say is, what we do is immensely political. And to, different extents, to a different extent in different countries. In Britain, classical philology is something that is profoundly classist. It is something related to the aristocracy of modern day Britain. Latin and Greek, ancient Greek, are the languages that you learn if you are Boris Johnson. It is not anything that you will have access to if your parents work in a factory. This is not the same in Germany. It's not the same here. Although there are similarities, not everyone will be able to go to a school or will find themselves going to a school in which um, everything is taught to the same degree. So there is still something about this. So there's a, in, in fact, the very name classical philology has class in it. And, um, do you actually know why it's called classical philology? Classis is Latin for the fleet, right? So that you have a selection of, of, of soldiers and that's a classicus, a miles classicus is somebody serving the fleet. So it's a selection of things and it means exclusion. If you're talking about classical, you're immediately talking about exclusion. And my impression is that what we exclude is much more than what we include. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if in the 21st century, this is still the best approach. 
Because if we continue the way we have done this for the last two, three hundred years of the history of our discipline, if we continue to do it in this particular way, we are continuing to produce an elite and to serve an elite. I'm afraid that's what, what you're doing. That's what we all are doing. We are serving an intellectual elite. Because let me, let me guess, even in Spain, if you go to a, a pub, a tapas bar, and tell them what you're doing for a living, the average response is not, oh, cool, yeah, I could have done this. That's probably not. It's like, ooh, what made you do that? Um, how did you enjoy telling your parents what you're, what you're doing? You, you spoke about this briefly when you got you know, convincing, convincing your own mother um, about this, this choice. When my father heard, oh, he's going to do Latin and Greek, he was like, great, let me just strike you from my testament, and that's good. I mean, how are you ever going to get a job with this? But we are part of an elite. And the, the problem with this is, is the following. We may continue to make the choices that we've made before and decide on the Greek side we should read Homer and Pindar and Thucydides, all fantastic authors, great authors. Some of us might even enjoy reading Plutarch, you know, still a great author. We may continue to do the same thing on the Latin side in schools, at university, and decide to read Marshall and Catullus and Ovid and um, Virgil and sometimes even Statius, sometimes even some of the, the, the Christian authors. If you're lucky and go to a university like this, you can study them. But we're still only studying a very small selection. You've seen today, you've looked at the evidence for this. I've given you the evidence that even within about 400 years from, say, you know, the notional year zero, which does not exist, of course, unless I've... No, there's, there's, have you seen the Spring Moore Review recently? Somebody reviewed a book that was called From the Year Zero to... Anyway. Um, so essentially from the BC AD change over to 400 AD, but even provinces like Britain and Germany are very different poetically. Very different. And we haven't even talked about Roman authors coming from that part of the world because there aren't very many. Germany is, gets a bit more lucky because we sometimes can claim and pretend Ausonius is one of ours even though he's really Gallic, obviously. But he talks about stuff going on in Germany. No poet ever really talks about Roman Britain um, except for um, when the Romans first thought they should, should be going there. It's a political decision. What we are reading most of the time in schools, we think is related to somebody's choice of what is great Latin. Now you may say, well, but Quintilian tells us that Virgil writes fantastic Latin and that Cicero writes fantastic Latin. But these people are educating for a Roman elite. Quintilian is a professor of Latin trying to educate the elite. The texts that we get transmitted through the literary canon are the texts produced for the enjoyment of Rome's aristocracy. And I'm afraid what we are doing, teaching these authors at university, is we're doing the same thing. If we keep teaching Virgil and Ovid, and I'm not saying stop, I'm just saying be careful. If we keep teaching these same authors, we're doing exactly the same thing. We are teaching students and new generations a selection of texts exclusively for a very small, written for a very small number of people. For the Roman imperial household and the senators and those who felt intelligent enough to appreciate it. 
we're talking about the entertainment of a few hundred, maybe a few thousand people, selected from a very short time period. Selected, if, if you're generous, from the third century BC, but who reads Plautus and Terence still? So realistically, from about 50 BC to what? 50, 120 AD? If you're reading Christian authors, you're lucky, you know, you can read a bit further, but still, a very small number of people whose job it was to rule the Roman Empire. We're not reading about that poor lady from Seville who lost her child. We're not reading about um, the, the, the merchant in Roman Britain who struggled and who wanted to have a better life. We're not reading about the Roman soldier who did not know how to handle the multi-ethnic composition of his army. We don't hear about the, German, um, about the soldier in Germany who did not know whether he would come back from enemy territory. We, did not, we don't read about, we don't hear about the, the fears of, um, of, of somebody who loses his freedman because he got killed by another freedman. We don't hear about this. But that's the majority of the Roman people. And that's the majority of the Roman Empire's timeline. Because if, I mean, especially when you consider whether or not the, the, the pyramid is correct um, about how the Roman society was structured, you know, we're talking about the, the top 1%. We don't talk about the other 99%. I think that's a mistake. And I think that's, that's why I need to ask this question, quis custodiet ipsos custodis. Are we controlling ourselves? You have been doing this for more time than we will tell the young people in the room. We have been looking at these texts for a long time, and we enjoy them. There's, to, to us, they speak in a way um, in, 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 in which we will, in, in, in a way that makes us feel like there's something bigger, something more, there's, there's a background, um, to all this, this culture. We have different approaches to, 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 to this. Um, f for you, um, to, to an extent, it has been about, um, you know, does, does literature live on in, in other contexts? I'm, I'm taking a slightly different, different approach, although, I mean, we keep thinking about this all the time. I'm not saying this is the, the one, one approach you've taken, but are we talking about art and the, the production of, of art that's designed to convey feelings? Or are we talking about the painting in the museum that's really expensive? And you can make this choice. You may have a firm opinion on this. But what I would like you to bear in mind is that however you decide, this has implications. And if we think that the life experience and the feelings is, is something that we can get out of storytelling, such as the, the epics of, of Rome's great poets, fine. But it's not the experience of the majority of the people who lived during the Roman Empire. It's the text that we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And they too benefited from reading the classics. And we need to know this. It's, it's like you need to read the Bible and understand something about the tales of the saints if you look at a church window, you know, if, if you wanted to know the background. But even if you don't know the background, you can still say, I like this, or I don't like this, or this captures, captures a feeling. This second question, whom can we reach and why? This is going to be a really important question for you especially if you go to school as teachers, but also at university. How many students do you take in every year in classical philology? Um, is, is, is your um, university's rector happy with that? Um, 
I seem to remember that only a few months ago there was um, a big thing, I saw it explode on Twitter, um, about the removal of classical languages from the school curriculum. Am I right? Is, is that something? Ha has there been a conclusion or is it happening? Do you, do you know? Hmm. What's the argument of those who remove it from the, from the curriculum? Times are changing, presumably. It's expensive, not enough students. It's, it's, it's a past, it's, it's like, you know, we, we always, it's, it's like opera, you know, who needs opera? It's, it's a very cheap thing. Opera is amazing, go to opera, go, it's fantastic, I love opera. Um, everyone should go there and suffer through somebody who can die for three hours, opera is amazing. But it's a cheap comment to make, you know, if you want to harm culture, choose the one that's related to an elite say it's no longer relevant and you've because you're in this subject you've chosen it you will say no it is relevant and then they're asking you how is it relevant and then what do you answer how's it still relevant i mean whether you read virtual or not is it going to change your life well it's it's certainly not changing life of those who see people escaping from from turkey on a boat trying to get somewhere safe in Italy. I mean, this is, it couldn't be more relevant right now because that's exactly the story of Aeneas. But, okay, how is it still relevant? How is Ovid still relevant? I'm not saying he isn't, but do you have an answer? I do have an answer how what we do is relevant. I've shown you texts that speak to problems that people are still having. Financial problems, mental health problems, dislocation. A lot of people are migrants. I'm one of them, not just here. I mean, even in Britain, I'm a migrant. I'm the reason why people voted Brexit, essentially. <laughs> um, I'm not even joking, it's, it's, it's true. But a lot of people aren't in the place where they were born. A lot of people are not in a place where their own language is the first language. this human experience has not changed. The, the, the question, how do you cope with financial struggle? How does it make people feel? How does it make people express themselves? Is something for which we have thousands of little poems. How do you deal with the loss of a child? How do you deal with pain? How do you do deal with not knowing where your relative is? Remember that one soldier who has lost his brother in the Varian disaster? How do you deal with the fact that you don't know where somebody is whom you love has been left? There are lots, well not lots, but there are, there are at least a handful, a dozen examples or so of people talking about somebody they lost during a shipwreck. You know, some traumatic experience. Well, we may think this is not relevant, but if you all of a sudden lose somebody on an airplane, you know, Malaysia Airlines that goes missing, it's very relevant. We have lots of little stories here. People love stories. Everyone loves a story. Believe me, everyone does. And don't believe anyone who ever says, believe me. But we do have these expressions of how people try to conce uh, conceptualize trauma, human experiences, and we can go out there and show them. Show them things that are directly relevant. We can speak to children in schools about experiences that they can understand, because they may be migrants, they may have lost a sibling, they may not know where their father is because the father is a soldier fighting for the UN, or if you're in Britain, obviously fighting everywhere and sticking a flag in it and calling it my country. Um, there, there are lots of experiences that are relatable. There are even little poems about losing your pet animal, losing your dog. No cats, but dogs. I, I don't know why they didn't like cats. Um, This is what we have to offer. It is something that we genuinely have to offer. And in addition to this, we have a lot more to offer for people who are a bit more advanced than somebody who's 14 year old at school. 
Because the one thing I never understood, the first Latin author I read in school was Caesar. Um, I started Latin at year five in school, so about this, this big. Um, my first foreign language. And Caesar was the first author I read in the original. What a waste of time. I mean, great Latin. It is very elegant, elegant Latin, but what a waste of time. If I could have learned something about actual people, not somebody who went to Gaul and killed everyone, and reading in great detail of how he went about this, because my strategic mind still has not improved. It's, it's not. And this is important because when we talk about whom can we reach, whom should we reach, I think there's, there's a treasure out there. We can go to schools in Seville and sh tell them, you know, the Romans were actually right here. They have the same problems you have. We can go to the museum and look at an example of how they suffered and how they felt about the hopes they had. They may be the same hopes you have. This is a beautiful material and we're not using it. And at university, we are in a fortunate position because we can design our curriculum to an extent. We can decide, I'm teaching this. At school, good luck with that. And I think this is something that I need to talk about to individually, depending on the country I'm at, how can we change the school curriculum? So a lot of the time I hear, oh, the Romans never wrote any children's books, for example, which is probably not true, but also, we don't need to read children's book with children. We can tell them about stories that are relevant to them and translate the texts that we have into a language that they can understand. This diversifies our audience. In Reading, Reading is next to London, one of the places with the greatest number of migrants from all over the globe. Do you think their experience is very different from that at Hadrian's Wall? I can show them exactly how to feel. I can even say, here's how the Romans proposed, to, here's how one Roman proposed to solve the problem. We can reach out to, to people from all those places of the Roman Empire once we start looking at this in a regional way, rather than saying it's all about what happened at Rome. Because all the literary authors you read, virtually all the literary authors, their only problem is, how can I be at Rome? And what do I do if I get sent away of it, right? Um, but these people talk about what does it feel like to, to be a slave? What does it feel like to, to lose um, a partner? What does it feel like to lose a sibling? It's different, but it's different. And it's invaluable. And it can help us to unlock audiences that we otherwise don't reach. And I think that moves on to that, to that third question. What, what can and what should we offer? And it, it also relates back to my question, if you are the curator of a museum, what should you be offering? One way of doing it is to do it like the archaeological museum does, chronologically. Sometimes by theme, you know, put all the metal stuff in one room and all the stone stuff in another. You could think about this very differently. You could organize the rooms in the archaeological museum here and say, um, women. Um, local religions. It, you could think about this very differently and you would reach a very different audience. Um, and I think as classicists, as somebody in classical philology, we need to think about this as well. How do we design our curriculum as the curators of our little museum in a way that it remains relevant and becomes relevant to people who otherwise might say, ooh, classical philology, what is your job going to be? You know, I mean, have I, I'm German, I'm not good at telling jokes, obviously, but um, in, in Germany, what do you say to a classical philologist? Take me to the station and quick, so that's essentially, how it goes, that's, that's your job prospect. Maybe we can do better. And I'll leave you with that final question because I don't want to get killed again. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to stop simply with this question. 
as people living here and now in this particular country, in this particular city, you will have to answer that final question. Unless you would like to go, to, to continue the way in which you're going, which is a very narrow path, in which it becomes harder and harder to tell people why they should be reading Ovid and Virgil, because there's no longer um, sort of an aristocratic nature of the type that existed 100 years ago. How are you going to change it? How are you personally going to change it? You've decided how to change it, even though it may not have been on your mind when you started doing it, but you've introduced material here for students to study that at many other universities they don't get to study in as Latin philologists. What are you going to do? How are you going to interpret your role mm -hmm. as curators? I'm going to shut up on this note, because I'm, otherwise I'm going to repeat myself. But one of the things that's, that's wildly important to me, and that's part of the, the book I'm writing at the moment, and, and something that has been on my mind for a long time, is we need to think, are we responsible, are we ethically responsible to the material that has been entrusted to us if we keep presenting it like an exclusive aristocratic art gallery. And I don't think we are. Because as I said when we first met, I think even Virgil probably first did not listen to the Odyssey, but probably first listened to his mother singing a little lullaby, or a wet nurse, or some teacher coming up with something to shut him up. And this is something that we need to bear in mind. If, if we are responsible to Roman poetry and song, we should be honest and say, yes, there are 24 names that stand out. But really, even within a relatively short distance like Roman Britain and Roman Germany, poetry and verbal art has been so different and so varied and so reflective of the concerns and hopes and the historical context but we need to talk about some, something massively bigger, some human experience and human feelings that we can still relate to. And it, once we understand this and we appreciate art, we can then move on and take the next step and say, now let's look at something amazing such as Virgil and such as Ovid. So that's my little preaching for today. Thank you very much for your contributions. If you have questions, you can ask them now or send me an email, like how soon will you leave the country? <laughs> it's, 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 it's fine, but um, I'm, I'm really grateful for the, for the input that, that you gave me and for the observations that you made. And just thank you for, for inviting me and listening to me for what feels like four endless hours, which it was. So, thank you.